So Patty had uh, my friend Vlad on the podcast today to talk about the SVB uh, bank failure and uh, Nativia Banking Services and a bunch of banking stuff. I thought it was yeah. actually a super interesting and timely conversation. I thought it was a very timely conversation. I think people will come away a little bit. If they've been upset, they've been, they'll be a little bit more relieved. Yep. And and uh, spoiler alert, alert um, Nativia is, uh, has a special um, arrangement, shall we say, for people who are going to NEAA. So listen yeah, towards to miss the that. end and find out how you might be able to you know, snag something. Yes. Um, Yes. And then James, I really, you know, James, you continued your uh, your series on overcoming objections. You want to give everybody a little taste of this week's? Yeah, we talk about what to do when they're in a contract. So they got an early termination fee uh, that they feel stuck with. How do you overcome that objection? I give you my my thoughts on that. And then uh, Patty, I loved yours today. A uh, topic that's been uh, pretty hot. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just a continuation on the crypto th theme and what Visa. You know, Visa is, has you know affirmed its its commitment, and it seems like the other card companies are pretty much in line with that. Yeah. So this episode is brought to you by ISOAMP. Uh, you can go to the web, go on the web to getisoamp.com and learn some more. Awesome. Here we go. Hey everybody, Pattern Hour here today with my good friend Vlad Sadowski, who is the CEO at Nativia. How are you doing today, Vlad? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so I think at this point, unless you're living in a cave or under a rock, you've probably heard about SVB and the resulting turmoil uh, in the banking market. Uh, Vlad is in a very unique position to comment on this uh, kind of developing saga uh, as he is both in, you know, has the, the merchant processing, but then also we have Nativia Banking Services. So Vlad's been really, really deep into the banking industry as well. And so I think it's a, a really interesting crossover. Um, you know, Vlad, before we dive in, I've got like a million questions about this bank failure, what you think it means for our industry. But before we do that, for those who maybe haven't heard past episodes, just give us a real high level. How did you get into this crazy business and what led you to uh, start Nativia Banking? Yeah, so um, I've been in the business for, uh, you know, a little over 27, now 28 years. And, um, and you know, as of as of this year, we started Nativia Banking um, as a result of uh, trying to move on with technology and bring the banking services to the market of ISO and agent that we think is uh, very well underserved and been omitted. And um, we wanted to give them a hand in the, in the, in the fintech playing field. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So, uh, SBB, which for those that don't know is Silicon Valley bank. Um, so this particular bank, maybe Vlad, you could start out by just talking about what's the deal with this bank. What, what makes them so unique versus other banks? So they could kind of understand, you know, the, the bank that we're talking about here that, that failed. Right. So number one, you know, compared to Chase and, uh, Wells Fargo and any top five banks, SVB built their reputation over the last five years in propelling innovation and really servicing the Silicon Valley hottest startups in the country. Um, and uh, their business model was around the fact that uh, their, where their innovation was is that they understood uh, software, software companies better than anybody else from the traditional banks. And so they funded them. They uh, invested in them from their VC arm that they've created. Uh, and they later on became a, uh, their bank. And in some cases, they're, you know, sponsoring infrastructures into the uh, uh, acquiring and uh, uh, banking system uh, of this country. And that's what made them very, very unique. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, it's not just that they, that they were a high tech bank. Um, you know, it was the way that was structured. And, and it's, it's, a, was... It's, it's an understanding of the high tech that made them different. Right. Exactly. Right. So how were they handling the deposits? And, you know, in your opinion, what was the biggest, what was the financial mistake they made in, in terms of how they structured the bank? I mean, so, I know they had huge deposits that were well above the FDIC insurance, right? I mean. Yeah. So, so the biggest thing about the, the bank, right, is how does any traditional bank makes money? They, they take deposits in, right? And then they lend, right? And now they have, you know, once they have the deposits, they need to find places to lend. So the uniqueness about SVB is that they lend it to a very, very unique vertical, which thought that had a lot of scale into it. Um, um, and that vertical was financial technology companies. 
And so uh, think about how banks got exposed into mortgages in 2008, right? right? Because they were lending into mortgage securities, right? Well, SVB thought, okay, we're smart guys in the room. We're not gonna we're not gonna lend to the mortgage industry. We already seen something like this. We're gonna lend into real businesses that are doing that are doing innovative stuff, and hopefully the the, the public will appreciate it. Well, that model worked for forty years, a pretty long time. But what happened to the model a couple of years ago is you had create they they are ecosystem created super big uh, fintechs, and they created. Um, smaller fintechs that would go either public or would raise a shitload of money. Excuse my language here, but uh, and and all of those, all of that money are, are ending up in the Silicon Valley Bank because somewhere you have to store your money. So once that once that situation occurred, Silicon Valley received an, a massive infusion of cash from. All of those SPAC services, all of those IPOs, all of those, un, you know, unpredictable, high-flying funding rounds that people would would be getting, and so it's all great. Now you could you could lend, but there the the amount of money that they received is significantly more that they could lend into the space, and they were lending primarily into one space, which is fintech, right? So. The problem is, if they would have, you know, decided to go into mortgages, then they would be repeating the, the uh, potentially repeating the faith of Chase and Wells Fargo. So they th thought about it and said, okay, you know what, we're going to go into into into, you know, deposit money with the government, right? The bonds, right, right. Um, and what they didn't realize is that they didn't anticipate the fact that Fed is going to go really, really aggressively increasing the interest rates. And so when they deposit the money with the bank uh, and then the bank deposits the money with, uh, uh, with by buying bonds, they buy bonds at the time that they buy them. So they bought them for 2% interest, uh, which was, you know, a year ago. Well, we all know that today it's close to 4 or 5%. It's an asset on the books. So now they have to record a huge loss because technically they're – investment has depreciated in value above 50 percent mm -hmm. they're probably the traded bank they have no choice but to do this or either add liquidity to sustain that losing business for the time being and or or, or do something else and that that's what really created a problem they really didn't have enough money uh, enough opportunities to lend uh into their vertical and didn't want to diverse into any, any other vertical because that would be in the learning curve for them. And they thought that you know safe investment would be would be would be US government. That's really in a nutshell mm -hmm. what happened to this company. Then the rest of it is financial mechanics, how it's being looked, regulations, uh tier capital, and all the other stuff that you know I'm not gonna bore you with. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, essence, but what you're saying is, is it happened? I mean, is that why it happened so quickly? Because it seemed to happen so quickly. Was it just the realization? Were they trying to like, you know, stick fingers in the dike or what? No. So the next, the next, the next piece. So that's the main piece of their financial trouble, right? Then the next piece is the current current days that we're living. We live in Twitter age, right? Right. So, you know, think of a GameStop. This is this is a bank run GameStop situation. Yeah. Right? If it sure. wasn't Twitter and the, the news would not spread out as fast, we would be having this bank in a fairly decent condition, beaten mm -hmm. up, but definitely not out of business. Right, right. Reality is uh, Twitter has created a, a, a classical bank run and the power of social media has shown themselves once again how quickly it could spread. Mm -hmm. so, what you're, so what you're saying, Vlad, is that the companies that had all this money at the bank, you know, this reporting came out, hey, there's, you know, a problem here with the, this asset class. And then everybody wanted to pull their money out basically at the at the same time. No, some hedge funds literally went out on Twitter and said, we advise our clients that we invested the money and to pull the money out of Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Peter Thiel, to be specific, yeah, um, came out and said, I'm advising all my clients that, that our firm is invested in 
to pull their money out of out of the bank. And he did it on Twitter. And that all started the chain reaction. So okay. same story that kind of a GameStop did a few a few months back. Only now it's a it's a, it's a bank run, right? And so so that created a forty six billion dollar withdrawal in one day. And it would have been it, and it would have been, you know, bad, but not bad enough if there was other withdrawals prior to that. So one of the things that I forgot to mention in my leading up to the to, to the to the troubles situation with Silicon Valley is that besides the fact that they've invested the money into the into the bond in, into the government securities, their deposits went down because due to inactivity in the um, venture market and slowing down the activity in the venture market, considering the times that we're in. Due to the fact that SPACs is a word of the, of the past and IPOs is twelve months out, majority of the of the of the companies that uh, SVB funded were money losing companies on a cash flow basis. Right, mm -hmm. and so traditionally the model worked. I am a fintech. I raise a hundred million dollars. I set myself a limit that any time I am at eighty million dollars, meaning I burn twenty million. I am going to go out and raise another hundred million dollars or another fifty million dollars, which will effectively put me in to, you know, one twenty, one fifty, whatever, two hundred million dollars, etc. So my balances with the bank, because that's where I'm going to hold my money, they're always increasing. Right. Here, I don't have any investment activity. I have money in the bank, right? So what am I doing when I'm losing? I am eating up my balances. Mm -hmm. And right. so SVB balances over a year, year over year, has decreased $146 billion, primarily due to the fact that their fintechs that they funded, that they did work with, et cetera, that, helped, that, that had the money in the bank, were using their cash balance sheets right. to their, their, negative, their negative cash flow. And 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 you're you know expanding on your example a bit more if I understand it correctly in that example of you know okay I raised 100 million I put it in SVB and when I burn 20 I've got 80 million still there hopefully I'm going to go raise more money but I can't in that situation I need to pull some of that 80 million the problem is SVB doesn't exactly have the that 80 million it's sitting in these longer term bonds is that is that an accurate description No that's, that's not correct SVB had the money all right um uh but um. Uh, at a slower pace, they had the money, but the forty-six billion dollar run is what created the problem. Okay, they, they weren't ready for that level of withdrawal. No, we're not ready for that for that level of withdrawal. In fact, if if every every company that they funded was you know withdrawing a hundred million, fifty million dollars, they probably were ready for that, but not forty-six billion dollars in one day. In one day, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about the payment processing industry first, and then I want to get to banking. So, yes. um. Our audience, ISOs, agents, a lot of them reached out to me a little nervous. Hey, should we be concerned? You, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, you talk about a different bank that's having some issues, I think, uh, today. But, you know, th there seems to be a little bit of a trend here. So how do you see this impacting ISOs, merchant acquirers, you know, our space specifically in terms of should they be concerned or the things they should be watching for? What are your thoughts on, on the impact in our industry? Right. So, so look, you know, um, when uh, when I first uh, uh, connected with you um, um, last week, uh, in in you know discussing some of these events, right? Nobody knew what the Federal Reserve was going to do, right? right? So, for lack of a better term, you know, Monday morning came in and they bailed them out, right? Right. I mean, we're talking we're talking about not covering two hundred fifty thousand dollars of FDIC insurance. We're talking about companies like Raku that had four hundred eighty nine million dollars sitting in SVB. Are going to get paid, right? But remember, the the depositors are being salvaged, not the stockholders. I mean, that is an right. important consideration, right? But we're, we're talking. But about they dig money, them in right? and rescue them, and you know, it's that whole yeah. too big to fail thing, right? Right, but but again, four hundred eighty nine million dollars. A lot uh, of money for the for the FDIC fund to have to dole out. Yes. Right. So 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 reality is, how does that translate into the into the acquiring business? Okay. So number one, we've had about 300 customers that had deposits between SVB and the Republic Bank, right? So we've actually, you know, held their deposits in the, in, um, you know, during the weekend to understand where we're going to fund this money to them because obviously, you know, 
they're gonna go into nowhere unless you know Monday morning came in and we we got saved, right? Um, but in 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 the in the not so pretty world, uh, this would affect the company's balance sheets sure. and their ability to pay payroll, their ability to to uh, uh, do business, their ability to do marketing. I mean, it's a ripple effect to the economy. At the end of the day, half the Silicon Valley was banking with SVB specifically, but then with uh, um, um, Signature Bank and uh, Republic Bank, it's, you know, was also a big deal. And Remember, at the end of the some... day, if the Fed hadn't done that, the whole entire economy could have could potentially have collapsed because of right. all so, the so, interconnections. So when you, when, when you, right, when you think about what government did in COVID, right? Mm -hmm. They had a f 15 million people restaurant sector, right? That they've saved, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yep. You know, restaurant restaurant hotels were the and travel were were the the most hit verticals within the COVID right, right. area right. Uh, era, um, and so this is no different. No, yeah, no, it isn't. Yep. You yeah, know, it's agree. a big chunk of economy, uh, and in this case, it's actually higher paying jobs, not lower paying jobs, right? right? So the unemployment rate and it's investment been, money, not just payroll, right? I mean. Yeah, but but it's but more, most importantly, the unemployment rate would have been astounding. It's yes. it's enough that that companies yeah. like Meta and all the other bigger fintechs are you know uh, cutting their cutting their cutting their uh, employment forces um, around the world in in the United States alone. Uh, this would have created a massive unemployment effect. You yeah. know, sure. probably more than it created for uh, leisure and hospitality industry during COVID. Uh, yeah, dollar wise, not not people wise, but dollar wise. Yeah. And so, so, so to, to kind of summarize, I think what I hear you saying, Vlad, is, you know, if the Fed hadn't stepped in, this would have been really ugly because the Fed stepped in. They kind of set this precedent of basically saying we're, we're backing up these banks. We're not going to allow these banks to fail. Uh, well, we're, we're not we're going to allow them to fail, but not to the extent that the depositors are going to lose their money. So what I think I hear you saying is, in your opinion, the crisis, as it might have had ripple effects into our industry, you don't really see those ripple effects coming our way, at least at this point. Is that what you're saying? At least, at least right now, it's somewhat controlled for the for the for the time being. But obviously, it's shaking everybody's mind that this can happen, right? So, yeah. uh, people are yeah. looking for additional banking relationships because they not want to spread their money because they understand Fed is not going to come in and bail out Raku second time for four hundred eighty nine million dollars. That's right. not happening, right. right? Right. And and then we've had I I actually happened to. Um, uh, be connected with another company called delivery.com which is a smaller fintech company that does deliveries in new york city and they literally sent out an email to every customer and every merchant i'm sorry we're working with our processor but we cannot pay you fees uh, or commissions that you've earned like literally Whoa. i actually saved that saved that email right um so those are the effects yeah and then if you can't pay right what happens to our, the, the other side of the equation for us? Chargebacks, right? Sure. So now you look, you're looking at reserves. Now you're looking at right. You're looking at all of the other stuff that goes with it. I mean, we have a lot of e-commerce merchants on the books, um, and they they they've relied on, on on some of these services, and so now uh, they would have been completely completely out of business, and then there would be you know massive massive chargeback situations. Huh. Um, Sure. That would that would affect that I've been so the ripple effect would go far beyond uh, what uh, sure. what the initial payroll conversation uh, that we started this 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 um, um, the yeah. discussions with. Yeah, sure. So basically, we're all very uh, fortunate that the Fed stepped in in this particular case and and at least kept any ripple effects from happening from SBB. And you we know, should really made, be cor correct. It's the Fed, the FDIC, and the Treasury Department. I right. Mean, yeah, but we need to we need to under, we need to understand that Fed is not going to allow anybody else, right? So we're looking at no. what's the effect on our business. Every bank in the country is going to get audited for this for stuff like this. They could have prevented this a long time ago, right? Yeah. Right. Um, because they should have seen those deposit the deposit balances, um, and inequality beforehand, right? Right. So uh, there's a lot of scrutiny. There's going to be a lot of scrutiny on the banks. Sponsoring banks are going to get scrutinized. Uh, whether it's uh, fintech banks are going to get scrutinized more than the regular sponsoring banks, for sure. Sure. And so that's those are the effects that are directly related to our industry. Hmm. Right. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, this is really good. So let's let's shift gears again, and now let's talk to Nativia Banking. So um, maybe you could start out by just kind of you know 
telling our audience that maybe haven't seen it before, what is Nativia Banking? Um, you know, what are these services that you provide? And then also, I'm really curious to hear how are you going to respond? You know, what are what are you doing with this kind of shift in the market and this, at the very least, this new awareness around banking services for, for business owners? What are your thoughts on this, Vlad? Right. So, so number one, um, there's products in this country that 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 allows for larger FDIC insurance. So, uh, Nativa Banking is actively working on extending the FDIC insurance coverage through um, a, a structure that would allow for up to ten million dollars in FDIC insurance per client. Wow! And and uh, this is something that's been in the country for many years. It was just you know something that people didn't pay much attention to. It only certain individuals that cared about it knew. And as a friend of mine would say that, he said, listen, you know, for me to go with your structure, Vlad, that I proposed to him maybe a few months ago when we were first discussing this, way before these uh, situations took place, um, he basically said, so are you telling me that if, 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 I, if I have my money at, at Wells Fargo and Chase and this guy has, you know, $10 million each in, in each one of those, those, uh, those banks, that these guys are really going to go down and this country is going to allow this to happen. And my money, I'm not safe with our, with our, with, our, um, uh, with Chase and Wells Fargo. And I said, no, you probably have a point. You know, those are the category of too big to fail. Right. And so number one thing that would, what's happening is that the monies are going to flow from some of the regional banks over to um, to some of the larger banks, right? Sure. And, and they're also going to flow from some of the less known banks and into more established banks. So Nativia Banking that we started, first of all, builds on the fact that we are sponsored because, you know, in the digital banking, you have to be sponsored just like an acquiring business. You have to be sponsored and you have to hold your deposits within a particular bank. Um, the bank makes an agreement with us to for us to perform the customer experience functions and the bank does all of the regulatory and depository functions. So. Um, our bank is Sutton Bank. It's the same bank as Square. And so we think that we made a smart choice by partnering with them because they obviously know what they're doing. And most importantly, uh, we think that uh, Square made a smart choice. So yeah. uh, although I'm not I'm not so sure considering that there's so many customers were in, um, in um, um, SVB as well, and they thought they were making smart choice. But <laughs> Uh, we think we, we think that uh, we actually you know made a phone call to those guys and we said that are you guys exposed into this, into this type of a scenario right because technically speaking it was an artificial scenario if you dig dig down into it there was no problem with the bank it's an artificial scenario created out of the fact there was too much money deposited in the bank right, right. and so um, um, one thing that a regional bank can do and we're going to be we're part of that network through Sutton Bank is the fact that we can disperse funds into the network of three thousand banks, and that's how we're able to um, to 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 extend our FDIC right, coverage. Spread the risk out, right? That's right, and yeah. and and basically, and, and basically, this gives us an opportunity. And a lot of banks in this country are are part of that network. Like I said, three thousand of them to begin with. Sutton happens to be one of them. So we 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 uh, uh, we think about that, and we're actively working on a product that's not ready yet, but. This is one of our things that to do on the to do list this year, considering the circumstances that happened. And uh, so, so that's 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 number one. Number two, we obviously have customers that now want to have at least two fifty, right? So we we want to make they, they want to make sure that they are covered, right? They have five hundred thousand dollars sitting somewhere else. They're no longer thinking that oh, I can have five hundred thousand dollars sitting in my bank. So they're looking for additional opportunities to, to, to create. And digital banking plays a huge role, right? Because you, out of your own seat, where you sit, you know, uh, uh, James sits in Pennsylvania, you know, how many, how many banks are around you, right? That you could spread your money physically. But in the digital world, you could spread your money really quickly, right? right? And so, so we're, you know, we're one of those banks, we're part of those banks that would take your deposit up to 250, right? And uh, we'll, we pay extra extra points uh, because we're in a digital world. So our cost structure is different than a physical branch. We don't spend $2 million a year on a physical branch. That's the national statistic number of what people spend when they have a branch. And so we're paying interest versus not uh, in, in, in 
uh, and and so we pay you the interest number one we will we'll get your funding of this insured to 250 to begin with and that's like an immediate opportunity for us um and for the majority of small businesses that's uh, that's that's an easy that's an easy decision to have right yeah. Yeah, I like it. So I think one of the one of the cool things about this, Vlad, and and you know, last time we did the podcast, we were talking primarily about you know selling banking services to merchants, right? And 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 that opportunity, yes. which obviously is huge. What I'd love for you to touch on a little bit on on this one though is the the banking for the actual ISO agent out there, mm. right? Because I think it's such a cool way for them to kind of get familiarized with digital banking. Um, full disclosure. I am banking with the TVA right now. My company does. We are we are have switched over. We still use our physical location bank for some things, um, but I've got the little TV app on my phone. I love it. It's fantastic. Um, you know, managing my accounts in one place and everything is really cool. So, um, talk up to our audience, Vlad, about what do they need to do in order to set up Nativia banking and to actually experience what this banking services look like, so that. They can also then expand, of course, and go out and hopefully sell banking services to their merchants. But talk about what they can do to get started with you guys. Right. So, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, we now have links, and uh, uh, they're going to be available um, um, after this podcast. Um, and uh, we have a special offer on those links to sign up with the TV Banking that I'm sure James is going to talk about it a little bit later. I'm not going to, I'm not going to steal the thunder from you, James. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, but uh, but um, um, the uh, uh, the major thing is that I personally experienced um, is the fact that in the ISO space we're looked at, and uh, when we're looked as a competitor, it's we get thrown out sometimes from banks. So right, I'm here to say you know today, especially with the question that you just asked, James, that we're ISO friendly bank. So right. an ISO an agent. Can say they're an ISO, they're an agent in the credit card processing. They don't have to explain that they're a marketing company like uh, some of my sub ISOs do, did in order to get into Bank of America. They don't have to explain that they're, uh, uh, you know, they're doing some other services, business services is another common word. Right. You can say you're an ISO and you're going to get approved. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's funny. I like that. <laughs> so, so to, to begin with, that's that that's that's pretty cool. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to lie. Right to that does it right there. Yeah, you don't you, you don't have to sold. lie to get your bank account. You know, it's kind of <laughs> it's it's an interesting concept. <laughs> yep. So, so we we come from the ISO world. We we breathe and live it every day. We want everybody to experience it. Um, um, our virtual cards, our, um, our our opportunities with with being able to sell it and make money from it. But most importantly, start with the fact that, you know, you you can talk to, to you can have an account in the bank that actually takes you for who you are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. I like yeah, that. And, really and again, I, I think there's so many really cool features and, and I want to get into all that. And we actually did some training together as well that I'm sure you can get from the TV. But um, but yeah, there's uh, there's some pretty cool stuff. So I think if you're an ISO, you're an agent, you know, definitely check that out. And we'll get some links to that in a minute. One other thing I want to touch on real quick. Um you're doing something really, uh, I thought, pretty creative with the NEAA. I was actually kind of surprised about this one. So uh, for everybody that's thinking about going to the NEAA, has already signed up for the NEAA, Vlad, tell us uh, tell us what you're doing. Hey, I'll be there, Vlad. Vlad, tell me what I'm, what I'm in store All right. for. Yeah, I didn't tell Patty about this yet, by the way, Vlad. So go, you have a captive in. audience right here, right? So, so look, uh, you know, we are doing banking services. I want to be politically correct. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but we should be act like uh, the, a bank that starts with it, right? And uh, first of all, Nativa Banking is uh, a major sponsor for, for NEAA. Uh -huh. And this year, Nativa Banking decided to do something that I think would be really cool. We are buying all your entrance passes. So all you got to do is open up a Nativa Bank account uh, or banking account, I should say correctly again. Right. And you'll have your entrance pass paid for. The key to the part, the point, you can, you'll have a link distributed to you. You could sign up, or you can download the TV banking app from the App Store, whether it's Google or Apple Store. There's going to be a promo code. You type in N E A A twenty twenty three, all lowercase, and uh, you can pay with a card. And it will be accepted. If you don't have the money on the card, then uh, 
All you got to do is pay with any other card, show us that it was paid, and we'll reimburse you into your account. Excellent. Excellent. Very cool. Yeah. I'm a, I get a there press pass, so I won't get the account, but that's okay. I'm going to tell everybody about it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, so I think that I think this will bring this is a this is a a, a very cool uh, thing that we we created with uh, with uh, the committee at NEAA. I think this is uh, uh, going to bring more people. And if you haven't been at the NEAA, uh, you now have a free way to go. A free way to go. I mean, what better? And it's supposed yeah. to be in, there's in no, Boston, there's no, not a bad no, place. Yeah, there's no there's there's absolutely no uh, no commitments. You know, you could, it's one per tax ID, just to give you an idea. But uh, outside of that, yeah. um, Excellent. you know, go, go sign up and uh, receive your free pass. Love it. Love it. So what we'll do is when, when we send out this episode, uh, you know, we'll have those links in there. Uh, so you can go back to the email or you can go to the description under the video. We'll have the links in there for you that you can go to, to get started with that. Um, you know, one other thing I'll mention as well, Vlad, uh, you know, uh, Vlad convinced me to crawl out of my cave uh, and to actually go to one of the shows, which I do very rarely. Uh, but I am going to be at the after what's well, called the after party, right? Is that what it's called, Vlad? Yes, it's an after party, right? Yeah. And so what so, date? That's so on March 29th, right? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK. And that's from eight to ten. Uh, and the TV is hosting the after party. I will be there speaking or doing something, but I'll be there. And uh, so definitely, uh, definitely come yeah, say hello it's, to it's me. In and, the TV, and, yeah. no. It's in the TV bank and after party. With James Shepard. Yeah, there you go. Right. So very cool. So I'll, have, awesome. I'll have to show up just so I can be there with James. That's right. Yeah. There Patty, you go. Come, there you go, Patty. Come come join us. We'll show you how to set up your TV bank account, Patty. So that okay. you're so you're all set. That'd be so, great. That'd well, be Vlad, awesome. uh Vlad, thank you so much for taking this time to go through this really complex thing with SVB. I know a lot of people were kind of nervous about it. I think you provided the information that we needed to process uh, what's going on. Also, I love obviously the TV banking. I'm a big fan. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the NEAA. Um, you know, last thing would be where do people go right now as they're listening to this? If they just want to learn more about the banking in general, they want to kind of see what it's about, how they open an account, whatever, like what, not just the NEAA stuff, but just in general, they want to learn more about the banking. Where do they go? Right. So, so what, what, what you can do is you can go to nativia.com, click on ISO banking. See, again, you don't have to lie. It's ISO banking. <laughs> Very self-explanatory and read all about it. Love it. Awesome. Glad, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your insights on this topic and uh, wish you great success. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me. This episode is sponsored by ISOAMP. You can head over to getisoamp.com. People say, James, what exactly is ISOAMP and why would I use it? It's very, very simple. If you or a member of your team is doing anything with statement analysis, please stop. All you need to do is head over to getisoamp.com. You can fully outsource the entire process, have the proposal templates. We pull all the data. We have the team that backs up the AI, meaning we do 100% of the statements, 100% of the time. Anything that needs a human intervention, we take care of that at no additional cost to you whatsoever, all included. We have the full automation, but we also have the not full automation uh, when we get a scan that doesn't look right or information we haven't seen before where we need a human to check it out. Average turnaround time last week was 11 minutes. It keeps coming down on a regular basis, but when it wasn't fully automated, our turnaround was 11 minutes. So head over to getisoamp.com, G-E-T-I-S-O-A-M-P.com. Request a demo. Check it out. So, Patty, today in questions from the field, we're continuing on common objections, and I got right. a really, uh, really uh, simple one today, and that is we're in a contract. So oh, yeah. We talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago with the uh, some of the other objections around integrated payments and things like that, but... Um, when they say that they're in a contract, what we want to do is a couple of steps that I like to go through. Um, okay. The first step we want to go through is we want to convert this objection into a financial objection. Okay? okay. So what I mean by that is a lot of times when they talk about we're in a contract, you know, what are they saying? Are they saying I made a promise to someone that I don't want to break? Um, that's going to be very difficult to overcome. Most likely what they're really saying is there are probably some kind of financial penalties involved with me canceling my account. So we want to make sure that that's the direction that we go because that's an easier objection to deal with. So when they say I'm in a contract, we say, I understand, you know, I can tell you most of the clients I'm working with today, they were in a contract when we started working with them. This happens all the time. Of course, the, the downside is there's a, an early termination fee. And so there's some kind of a fee that, that has to be paid. Usually it's either $295 or $495. Uh, do you have any idea what that uh, what that is for you? Now, they normally won't have any idea. 
Um, most of the time they don't. And so what I'll do is usually I'll say, well, let's just assume it's $495. That's usually kind of your worst case scenario. So let's assume it's $495. Uh -huh. So what I'm doing is in their mind, I want to make sure and associate the fact that if you want to switch to me, you can, but it's going to cost you $495, right? right. Right. That's where I want to get them at before I try to overcome the objection. In other words, you got to clarify the objection before you can overcome it. You know, sure. what sure. exactly are you overcoming? You know what I mean? Because sometimes they'll say, well, no, it's not about that. It's because I'm with my bank and I have a loan with them and I signed an agreement that I would do merchant services. It's like, well, now we have a different. Now you have a whole different case. Yeah. Right. And so if we can get it down to a financial situation, that's usually going to be really good. And by the way, we'll go with the, I'm with my bank objection later. Um, but for this particular one, they're in a contract. They have an early termination fee. You have two options, okay? Option number one is you pay it. Right. Which is not like the worst idea. If you're going to, if there's any kind of decent profit uh, there, then pay the early termination fee and get right. it over with. You'll make it up in no time. Right. Uh, at the very least, you might split it with them or something. But, right. you know, then it's to overcome that objection. You know, all you say is, so basically what you're telling me, uh, Susan, is if I was willing to cut the check for the $495 or whatever it ends up being, you're saying that you would strongly consider moving over with us. Is that right? And right. then you just move forward, right? So yeah. that's easy. But what if you can't do that? What if you don't have the ability to pay that fee? You don't want to pay the fee or your ISO won't pay the fee. Uh, how do you get past it? Well, what you do is now that we have a financial objection, we just keep it financial. It's really simple. So I say to them, um, okay, well, you know, so let's assume it's 495, worst case scenario. And I've showed you that with dual pricing or whatever it is or interchange plus, I've shown you that I'm going to save you $1,000 a month, right? right? I'll say, right. now let me, let me ask you a hypothetical question and uh, bear with me. Let's assume for a second that I don't sell payment processing. Let's, let's hypothetically, I'm a financial advisor. I sell stocks. I sell, you know, things right, like that. Right. I think I know where this is going. Go yeah, ahead. I've said this one before. Uh, I'll say, so let's imagine that I came to you and said, I've got a stock I'd love for you to invest in. Okay. It's $495 per share. The dividend is $12,000 a year. Right. $12,000 a year. Every year you get a $12,000 dividend and it's $495 a share. Would you be interested in investing? Yeah. They usually smile, you know, and they kind of get what you're doing and they'll say, well, yeah. And I'll say, yeah, you know what you did? You, the question you'd ask me is how many shares can I buy? Right. That's what you right? want to know. And they'll say, yeah, of course. And I'll say, well, I've got bad news for you. I've only got one share I can sell you today. And it's your early termination fee. Right. You pay right. 495, you're going to make $12,000 a year into your bottom line because of the savings. Right. So um, that's how I like to do it. Uh, yeah. I like to keep it financial. Um, keep if you it do financial. that, yep. you're going to have a much better odds of overcoming it. Then in another one, we'll talk about the bank one, which is a little bit different, but we'll cover yeah. that in another episode. Thanks, James. Well, James, despite reporting to the contrary, Visa remains committed to the cryptocurrency market. That's the word from Kai Sheffield, who's Visa's chief uh, crypto honcho. Okay. Uh, Reuters had reported uh, late February, citing unnamed sources that both Visa and MasterCard had put the brakes on plans to forge new partnerships with crypto firms. Mm. Several other news outlets picked it up and ran with it. But Sheffield quickly put the brakes on that rumor, insisting that as far as Visa is concerned, the story is inaccurate. He did this on his Twitter account. Now, of course, everyone's familiar, and we just talked with um, Vlad about the crypto melt meltdown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Reuters article said Visa and MasterCard got spooked. Um, you know, and they're just going to put everything on, on, on hold pending regulatory certainty. Right. Now, here I have to say, you know, anybody waiting on regulatory certainty is going to be waiting for an excruciatingly <laughs> long time. Yeah, I mean, think about it. It's been 15 years since the notion of Bitcoin was first put forth, and policymakers are only now discussing how to regulate it. Right. But I digress. Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this is what Sheffield had to say: "Quote, despite the challenges and uncertainty in the crypto ecosystem, our view has not changed that fiat-backed digital currencies running on public blockchains." have the potential to play an important role in the payments ecosystem. Ecosystem. Mm -hmm. He then added, this is the time to build. Anyone building at the intersection of crypto and payments, please reach out. We'd love to work with you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, MasterCard hasn't made any public statements, but executives there have told news outlets the company continues to investigate use cases for crypto's underlying blockchain technology. 
Um, MasterCard spokesperson told the news outlet BlockWorks, quote, our efforts continue to be focused on the underlying blockchain technology and how that can be applied to help address current pain points and build more efficient ecosystems for consumers and businesses. Huh. You know, last year, it should be noted, MasterCard announced a crypto source program to help financial institutions to, uh, deliver secure crypto and other digital assets to customers. They said, uh, Jorn Lambert, Chief Digital Honcho at MasterCard said at the time, our commitment is simple, to explore crypto and the underlying digital assets technology to support better consumer choice and payments. Hmm. And of course, as we discussed here, merchants are, are ready for a future with crypto payments. A survey last year by uh, PaySafe found 15, just 15% 15 don't ever expect to accept crypto. Wow. And a little more, 17% already do. Yeah. So. Yep. Definitely a trend worth watching. And uh, I think Visa is heavily invested. I can't imagine that they're going to back away from at this point either. I can't imagine they would back either. out of that investment. No, no. Yeah. So good stuff, Patty. Uh, appreciate that one. Sure. sure.